Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the MakerBot Explorers podcast. This is a thing we're going to do where we invite the, 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 the explorers on the frontier of MakerBotting to talk to us and tell us what they're doing and give us an inkling of what's happening in the future. We've got Tom Burtonwood, an educator based out of Chicago with us. We've got Corey Renner, an engineer at Local Motors, specializing in mechatronics. We've got uh, Thomas Lapoma from Rest Devices, who's in the middle of launching a new product. And we're going we're gonna to get into it and have a nice conversation. First up is Tom Burtonwood. Tom, good to have you. Thanks for joining us today on the, on the Explorer podcast here. Oh, for sure. It's great to be here. It's awesome. And uh, t I know I, Tom, has, uh, Tom, has been, Tom has been a Thingiverse user for a, a while. I've been following your work for a while. And then I showed up in Chicago and was like, hey, what are you doing? Let's get together. I need to hang out with you. Right. And you're an artist and educator based in Chicago. And you teach 3D printing and yep. art and web design at the Art Institute of Chicago and Columbia College. You recently wrapped up the Art Institute Innovation Lab, a uh, makerspace located in the Harold Washington Library in downtown Chicago. You've also had your own art gallery and just done a ton of other things. Yep. Recent Hi. projects include a bunch of stuff you've done with MakerBot Digitizer. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, what I've been doing is um, just scanning the stuff that's been around me. Uh, my wife's uh, sculpture, for instance, this is a piece that I posted to Thingiverse uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it's a pretty complex piece. And as you can see, uh, the scan uh, of the object came out really well. So I've been taking Holly's sculptures and uh, scanning them in uh, with the idea that we then modify them, uh, turn them into modules, and then make larger sculptures of the sculptures. Uh, other things that I've been scanning uh, have been like this architectural column, which you can see on the digitizer uh, just behind me, right there. And that's the piece that Siege, uh, that uh, Zheng3 uh, put on Thingiverse uh, a couple, about a week ago, I think. So did he shrink it down? Yeah, and then this is the version that uh, Zheng made. And as you can see, he's made it in pieces so that you can print it real easy and then scale it up and scale it down. Um, other stuff that I've been scanning, oh, let's see. Uh, this guy, I don't know where this came from, uh, but he came out really beautifully. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. I mean, the idea that as an artist you can take any object of a certain size, throw it on the digitizer and scan it is amazing. It's a total game changer. So it's, uh, it's really beautiful to be able to use it. I like your stuff you're doing with scale where you've got your big column and right. then it gets small or you right. take your partner's work and, right. and then you can make it go giant. Right. Well, the thing with the column, because it is a little bigger than your average sort of digitizer object, so the trick is to scan the base and then flip it upside down and scan the bottom. And uh, it works quite well. It's nice. Nice hack. So talk to us a little bit about the, your, the Chicago Library Makerspace and what's that all? Well, the Makerspace is, was a really cool experience. I mean, I was there for like four weeks, I think, doing a 3D scanning workshop using, uh, using Autodesk's uh, 1 to 3D Catch. And I was just teaching um, just everyday folk, people who'd never used any kind of 3D scanning before, who had no idea that their digital camera was actually a 3D scanner. Um, and we would go around. The first week, I showed them how to use the application. The second week, we went around Chicago, and we did 3D scans of architecture. And so then we're starting to digitize the downtown district of Chicago or the beautiful uh, ar architectural ornament and stuff. And then they come back to the lab, and they print it out. But the lab in general is just this amazing thing, right? People go to libraries to, to learn to make stuff and to see how stuff was made. And now they can go to libraries and actually make stuff. Um, so you've just got people who are going in to get a book to read on the bus, who are walking past the makerspace, and who are walking in and going, what the hell's this? And seeing these laser cutters and makeup arts and uh, CNC machines in action. Yeah, it's just an amazing thing. It's a really beautiful experience. And can you talk a little bit about your architecture projects and, and this book that just has taken uh, off? Well, the book, so this is the, um, this is the Arihan. This is the 3D printed book that I was posted on Thingiverse. And so I took a bunch of scans, some that I made, uh, some that, uh, like this one by Pretty Small Things uh, from the uh, Natural History Museum. And then I think 
this one, the Bodhisattva, was from the uh, Matt project that we did a couple, like a year or so ago now. Um, and so this was a prototype. This book, uh, as you can see, it sort of opens up like so. It was a prototype for a project that I'm doing here in Chicago now, where we're 3D scanning uh, Louis Sullivan's architecture. So these are Sullivan is a pretty big name here in Chicago. Elsewhere in the States, not as much, but hopefully we'll change that. And so we're taking these really beautiful um, 3D uh, low reliefs that were produced towards the back end of the 19th century um, and digitizing them. And so we're going to make a 3D printed architectural reference book. So these are, these are parts of books that you, are parts of buildings, actually, where you're, you're really lifting the design off the building and able to showcase it. Right, exactly. So these are buildings that have been torn down. A lot of this, uh, a lot of these things have been lost, essentially, as cultural objects or as uh, architectural uh, experiences. And so what we're able to do is to digitize it and then put it back out into the, into the rest of the world through the internet. So this is, so I took the, um, the ball bearing. Uh, That's cool. So I'm working on a new hinge right now. So the idea is, so you've got two pages, right? And so then, let's see if we can do this. You could read the book, right? It's like so a that's, mechanical book. Right, exactly. So it's totally steampunk. Um, <laughs> and then the other cool thing is that so the books, I'm doing them with the positive and the negative. So if we take some, uh, some Play-Doh, I should have been a little bit more prepared. So Play-Doh, uh, book shove the Play-Doh in the mold, and hey presto, magic of television, we have our scan, right? Or we have Whoa. our 3D bottle. So one of the ideas behind the book, the initial book, was grade school teachers, kindergarten teachers, could have this three-dimensional 3D printed book, and then they could share sculptures and textures and reliefs with their class, they could make copies very easily with stuff like Play-Doh, and then they could make stuff out of that. They could do it out of clay and paint it and fire it. So then the book becomes a photocopier, right? Play-Doh <laughs> is, Play is the new Xerox. Wow. Uh, I, you know, the idea, I, that, I didn't even, that takes it to a whole other level, the idea of having it be a book, but then it's also really a manufacturing mold. Right. Well, so the thing that's cool about books is they transmit ideas, right? So you read a book and ideas are transmitted to you. The cool thing about these books is they transmit objects. Cool. Uh, I want to. I was just curious. Are there any are there any questions from any of the other folks we have on the podcast? Oh, and I should say we've also got Kate here, who's community manager at Thingiverse. Um, um, yeah, I've, I've, I'd love to throw a question out actually. Sure. Um, so I mean, it seems like you're doing some some kind of advanced modeling and stuff. Do you do everything in, in freemium software, or do you have commercial packages that, that you kind of use to aid in your design? Well, one of the things that I did a couple, about 18 months ago is I, I got a copy, a pro copy of NetFab, and that really helped. So a lot of the booleans and stuff that I'm doing with the, um, the negative spaces and joining things together, I often do in NetFab, and I find that to be just like uh, a really great workhorse tool. <laughs> what I'm teaching... I try to use as much freemium stuff as possible so that I'm bringing people in without a massive sort of uh, cost that they're yeah. going to have to incur to get involved. So using Tinkercad uh, to import and uh, Boolean stuff together and do differences in unions, yeah. uh, using Blender to do the same thing. So as much as possible, OpenSCAD. So I, my tool chains when I'm teaching, I try and use those kind of applications. Uh, but in terms of what I'm doing with my work, uh, I'll use whatever tool I've got available, and so uh, Rhino, um, yeah. uh, Maya, uh, Blender, uh, NetFab, uh, yeah. But cool. I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of open source and um, freemium type stuff, and particularly from a teaching perspective, I think that's crucial. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, anything, else we, anything else for Tom? I mean, I guess I just wanted, one thing I wanted to add about the digitizer is, you know, I've been having to think about, you know, where its sort of real sort of uh, amazingness lies. I mean, first of all, you've got this machine 
that's uh, easy to use, it's fast, and it's reliable. So if you, uh, you just have to plug it in, calibrate it, and you can start scanning. The scans take about nine minutes, so you're not committing to a longer space of time. Um, you know, some of the other scanners that I've used it can be an hour, hour and a half process, which is a lot of time to take for each object. Uh, and the manifold, you know, the watertight manifold meshes. There's no messing around in MeshLab. There's no messing around stitching uh, wireframes together. Uh, it just works. And that is really a game changer because then you're opening up the 3D scanning to a whole group of people who wouldn't necessarily have access, you know, to a 3D scanner um, or that kind of technology. So what I'm looking forward to seeing online soon are uh, asteroids and meteorites, um, architectural artifacts, obviously, uh, medieval artifacts. I mean, basically, the world's full of objects that have never been digitized, right? That's what the digitizer is for. I, you know, it makes me happy to hear you say that because we put a lot of energy into making it easy and accessible and the idea that you and others are using it to basically just as a portal to take physical things and put them into the digital. You know, I think it's it's going to be people like you and, and folks who have things to right. basically digitize them. And I think you're right that, like, uh, meteorites, like, I didn't even think about that. I I bet you there's somebody who has, like, a collection of a 1,000 meteorites right. or somebody I, like that, and they need to have... Right. And these are important a, stuff. Right, this yeah. is important stuff. This is where the life, arguably, on planet Earth came from. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tom. Okay, let, we're going to move to Corey. And uh, let me, here we go. So Corey Renner is at uh, Local Motors. Now, if you don't know about Local Motors, you should go check it out right now. I have been a huge fan from the beginning. And they did this thing that, that nobody had done before. They basically said, we're going to make a car, and uh, we're going to ask you to design it. And when they said you, they actually meant the internet. And they put it out there, and people submitted ideas and built on each other I uh, other's ideas. And really, they, they ended up uh, choosing a design that is just so hardcore awesome. It's a, it's a, it's a rally racer for the desert. And I was lucky enough to go and visit the local motors play, uh, local motors uh, micro factory, and Jay gave me a ride, and I was expecting to run, you know, kind of tear it up around the parking lot. And he 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 hits about like he turns the corner of the building <laughs> and hits the pedal to the metal, and up ahead is a jump, and he's like, "Keep your head back, keep your head back," and I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> I keep my head back." We launch into the air. Like, my iPad was on the floor. It's, like, floating in the air in front of me. <laughs> and we do this huge jump. It's one of these, it's one of these machines that can just take, take a beating. And it's, you know, it's made to win races. So I total, I, I'm a total geek for this. So, um, so I'll stop there and say, Corey, what, what are you doing with 3D printing? How, how, are you, how, are you, how does this help you in your work? Um, okay, so I'm an engineer here, so I'm, I'm in the business of solving problems. So all the things that come across my desk are, you know, how are we going to do this, how are we going to do that, and I, I actually brought a couple of things to talk about, just randomly grabbed some things that are sitting on my desk. Um, we're building a, uh, a powered bicycle right now, and one of the things we needed there was a headlight. So I chose this headlight, and I needed to make a gimbaled mount for it so that it could, you know, be adjusted up and down. So this is the design I came up with. And this is about two hours to draw this up. And it's actually a little more complicated than you might be able to see on the video. But there's a little rib that um, clips onto the light. And there's a boss inside that engages with a hole. But basically, in about two hours, I come up with the design. And then the printer's sitting right on my desk. And in about 45 minutes after I designed it, I've got the finished part. And the, you know, there's this indescribable joy when you actually put something together. And on the first try, you know, it works. And it kind of snaps together and clicks like that. And you can see how, um, how the light actually works. And in the, in the finished product, it's going to look like this. It actually sits behind a metal bezel, so it's got that adjustability. And basically, the, we use our printer here for everything. It's, it's running 24-7. It's running right now, um, constantly pumping parts out of the thing. It's, it's great. I mean, we can go from an idea to a, a part in our hands in no time. Now, do you tend to, when you're making stuff, do, are you making prototypes, or are you doing, 
where for you where do you, where for you is the volume where it makes sense to like go and have an injection molded or, or take it to the next level? Uh, so yeah, we prototype a ton of stuff on it, but we're actually doing uh, production parts too. Um, on just about every vehicle that we're making right now, there is a at least one or two parts that are 3D printed. So on the rally fighter that we were just talking about, there's a picture of it behind me. Um, the rearview mirror is on that thing. Um, we had to get the base of the rearview mirror to conform to the shape of the body panel. And we're a low volume manufacturer, so you know having production parts made and, and having the molds created would be prohibitive. So in this case, we were able to you know draw it up, print one out. We did some torture testing on the materials because we're in Arizona here, and it you know it'll get up to about 110. Uh, so we printed some parts and left them out in the sun and see if they melt or get soft, and they don't. They didn't. Um, so actually, the rally fighters leaving the factory have 3D printed um, mounts for the rearview mirrors. These um, the bicycles that we're doing, these clip-on mounts, these are all going to be 3D printed. On some of the bigger things, um, we're prototyping, but we're we're not necessarily sending out parts on on the areas where it doesn't make sense. So we kind of um, on the bicycle, for example we have a big show next week and the bicycles are going to go to that show with 3D printed gas tanks. And that's a, this is a large part. This is like a, about a 17 inch long part that we print in sections and stick them together. Um, the production ones though, we're actually going to use those 3D printed parts to be the basis of the molds, um, to have the production parts coming off them. So the 3D printing is, is a part of almost everything we do here. It's, it's, it's in every vehicle. It's, that's probably the most used machine in the shop right now. When people order a car, they go to local mo the local motors micro factory, and then they they manu manufacture it with the folks there, and they get yes. to really build their own car. Are you doing anything with like customization, or like are people wanting requesting hood ornaments, or is there anything like that that's happening, or is, is... so? Well, at this point, it, every car is is unique. People get to put yeah. their own stamp on it. They they pick the exterior design and they pick the interior and whatever they want to do, and that's actually something that we're going to move forward with with 3D printing and seeing what other customizations we can do. We're actually on the verge of rolling out our first, um, we're calling it a Mobi factory. It's basically a, a container, like on a tractor trailer, um, but it's actually a, a factory in miniature. And there's welders, and there's each one's going to have actually um, two MakerBot printers in it. Um, and that's that's part of what we want to do. We want to, every time people come down to the factory, they love it. They get to see you know how everything's built and get their hands in it. and at this point, we only have the one factory, and this is a way that we're actually going to spread that around and get it so that people can come in, print what they need for their car. If they have a rally fighter, if they want to do something custom, great, but uh, they're not limited to that. They can come in and you know make parts for their Civic if they want to. And uh, yeah, we want to we want to get that out there, get it in people's hands, and see what kinds of amazing things they come back with. So if I understand that right, you're making not only do you have your regular factory, but you have you're making mini factories. Is yep. We're making uh, like probably actually uh, micro-sized factories. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, the first one's actually being completed now. It's it's going to hit the road tomorrow. It's going to uh, Vegas, but the plan is to build several of these and, and distribute them around the uh, around the states. Excellent. Uh, I'll give you my address later. You can help me deliver. Perfect. Right, me too. <laughs> All right. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Corey? This micro factory thing is just sounds amazing. Um, yeah, it's just I don't know if it's really a question, but just like drop shipping uh, micro factories all around the country just sounds like a, a, an amazing, amazing idea. So I wish you the best of luck with that. Thank you. There's a, I should have mentioned there's coffee shops in the front too. So you know <laughs> that there's actually like a, a window so you can get a cup of coffee and, and there's you know a miniature like showroom portion and then the the back of it's actually a shop um, where people can actually fabricate things. Very cool. Very very cool. That's awesome. Um, so I, I got a couple questions actually. So um, I mean, you said that you're making like a gas tank out of uh, the kind of the MakerBot, and I know like it's the first one's more for for display purposes, but you're gonna start making molds out of that and stuff. Um, so the first one is, I mean, I've tried to make waterproof parts before, and it usually involves like an acetone bath or or a PLA smoothing. Um, do you do any treatment to some of the parts that you're making um, before it actually goes out the shop? So on the on the first ones that we're doing right now, the ones that we're building for the show that we're doing, the um, the tank that's 3D printed is actually cosmetic, and inside that there's a TIG welded aluminum tank. Right. Uh, but actually, our first thought was when we first did this, we were wondering if we could actually get away with a 3D printed tank. And what we did was we we printed a tank out in sections, yeah. and we were experimenting with various sealers to actually yeah 
seal the tank and, and put gasoline directly in it, which which did work, by the way. Really? Um, so we, we actually have a few of those laying around, and it's, it's really neat. Um, but as far as a, you know, for a production one, we're not looking at doing that right now because the gas tank is directly over the engine, and yeah. if we discover that, oh, they crack after a while or something, that could be kind of a disaster. But we're definitely thinking along those lines. We're, we're constantly kind of stretching and seeing what we can do, and, and that experiment did work. Very cool. Mm. Awesome. Um, so I, I had like a slightly other half of that though. So like if you're making a really large part, sometimes as I'm as I'm making really large prints, um, like different sides of it will start to warp up, and the alignment will kind of come off a little bit. How much of a problem did you have with the aligning of multiple very large sections to actually make the tank? We've actually had really good luck. The, the tank's actually not even the biggest thing that we've made with with our MakerBot. We're doing um, the engine covers are actually uh, oh. made on this thing too, and they're they're very large. They're um, the the completed thing is probably two feet tall and. I don't know, wow. 14 or 15 inches wide. And what we're doing is we're printing them in sections. We're adding, um, we can't use, um, we can't use the, the supports um, in the MakerWare just because we would go through a ton of plastic. Yeah. So what we're doing actually is in the CAD system, we're being very strategic about, okay, we're going to add a post here and just putting them in, in specific places so that we're only supporting where we absolutely need to. And we've actually made the parts so that we have um, holes that, that line up the various sections. Mm -hmm. And when they come off the printer, we're actually inserting spring pins and then the parts clip together Got and they're in, so the alignment is guaranteed. And then once the parts are assembled, at that point we normally epoxy them on the inside, and yeah. then they're going through and just going through um, like a normal um, treatment that you would do, like if you're working a car or something. You know, we're using uh, lightweight body filler and kind of, you know, to, to take the ripples out, and, and yeah. we finish them the same way you would finish any other automotive parts. Got it. Very cool. Next up, we've got Thomas, and I'm a big fan of rest devices. I've got I've, my daughter was actually a premium was born two months early, and you've got a a product that you've designed, and it went through some iteration. Originally, it was a bigger a bigger thing, and then you 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 focused on making these onesies. And can you tell us a little bit about how your product developed? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I mean, we started out of school at MIT, kind of working on an adult apnea device, so like some like a, a medical product for, for diagnosing sleep disorders. Um, and over time, it really uh, transitioned into a product for, for infants, a, a baby monitor that monitors respiration, skin temperature, body position, pretty much everything you'd want to know. Um, and then we send all that information to the cloud, and we bring it back to, uh, to the parents so that basically they don't ever have to worry about how their kid's doing. Um, but the product development cycle for us was, was really interesting because um, coming out of school where we had infinite number of tools and we could really build whatever we wanted to without thinking about it, um, and then going into a startup where we have no tools and no money and really no ability to do anything, um, we were building a medical product. And so going into the hospital and testing things, we needed to have something that, um, that looked safe and, and was safe. Um, and looked like a refined product. And so we looked at a lot of different ways that we could do this, and, and the fastest way that we found was simply just buy a 3D printer. Um, we could we, you know, we could mill parts, we could send machine parts out, um, but then that wouldn't enable us to really change things very quickly. Um, and as we're iterating through, um, through different versions of software and hardware, um, and as we're kind of going through this entire learning process, we needed something that would allow us to also make the physical design of the product um, change along with with everything else. Um, so the f one of the first tools we, we bought coming out of school was was the MakerBot, um, and so right away we had very kind of refined parts going into the hospital, which was really nice. Um, and then what was really interesting is when we transitioned to kind of the baby product. Once we started working with parents, we thought you know we're leaving kind of this medical space behind. We're going to have so much more room to operate, and we don't have to worry about. Um, like review boards and safety commissions, but what's interesting is that parents are so much more critical about how something is going to look and feel. Um, and so, you know, we were really lucky in that we had the MakerBot, and it enabled us to make these very kind of um, refined and and polished cases. So that uh, when we started to go take these to parents, the first thing they 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 would say was, "Oh, this this feels like a product. This feels like something that I can use and put on my on my child and feel completely fine with it." So you, oh, I have to give you a thank you because you actually started with one of our early 3D printers yeah. back when you had to put it together. So, um, uh, you, thank you for supporting us in the yeah. early days, and <laughs> and um, and it's been great to see your company grow. What, what's coming up for you? Yeah, so um, you know we're just going through our first production production run now. I mean, we just sent out the parts this afternoon, so that's really exciting. Um, come January, you're going to be able to go into uh, any store nationwide and kind of purchase it. So that's really exciting. 
But uh, even cooler is that you know we're we're never stop stopping um, kind of our process of creating new products. So every time we talk to a new parent, we're asking them, "What is your problem? What's the next thing you you want to see?" Um, and what's really fun about about how we operate and how we build stuff is that um, when a parent comes up with an idea and they say, "It would be awesome if you could solve this problem for us," we can do it, but not in a year. We can do it in a week. Um, so actually, we had a trade show uh, a week ago and. And three weeks, three weeks before the trade show, a parent came to us with kind of this really cool idea for a bottle warmer. Um, the idea was that you know instead of having the bottle warmer in the kitchen, you could have it in in the kids' room, and it would it predict when a bottle needs to be warmed for you, and then it would send a, send an alert an alarm to your phone. So by the time you wake up, everything's kind of solved, um, and you don't have to lose any more sleep. So what's crazy though is we had the trade show in three weeks. So what do we do? We you know we we start building. Um, so this is actually uh, the first kind of version, or I guess this would be the second version. Um, and this is the bottle warmer, um, and you know it looks pretty refined. It's not a finished, you know, a finished production ready part. But you know we have time for that. But what's cool about this is um, this is completely functional. It has all the electronics. Um, it can successfully connect to your iPhone and cool and warm a bottle and do all the predictive stuff. And um, you know this is ready to be taken to a house and be tested and, and sent to a parent and, and to get all the feedback. So um, because we have the MakerBot, that, and by the way, that is completely made of MakerBot parts. Uh, because we have the MakerBot, we can uh, iterate and, and design so much faster um, and come up with these really cool ideas and immediately test them with, with parents. So that's really cool. I like the, uh, the, out, uh, the outer, like almost like lace light like uh, part of that. It really looks like something like kind of from the thing of the land of Thingiverse, like the right. little that that kind of architecture just really rings as like kind of that that community <laughs> development. Yeah, aesthetic. definitely, uh, definitely a lot of inspiration from Thingiverse. You know, like one of the fun things to do on, on like a Friday afternoon is just go through Thingiverse and see see what's out there, um, take inspiration from from all the cool stuff that's out there. So cool. Any questions for Thomas about his work? Well, I know that you mentioned uh, you got the the Thingomatic. Um, wh what have you been doing with it recently? Yeah. So, oh yeah, I forgot to actually talk about this. So, um, you know, something else that we kind of do in our in our product cycle is we're not just thinking about uh, different ways to very quickly produce um, new products. We're also thinking about ways that we can completely change how we develop and build the product in this entire life cycle. So, what's really interesting about the onesie is that. Um, it's it's a wearable garment. It's a it's a wearable electronics on a garment, and nobody's really mass produced these before. You know, Nike's kind of tried, and, and Under Armour's kind of tried, but no, they, we can't just go to a factory or a manufacturer and say build this for us because they have no idea what we're doing. Um, and and even more interesting is that some of the components we're using are incredibly expensive. One of the glues we're using is actually about a dollar a drop, and we need to make sure that we use a very precise amount of this glue in a very precise location. So. Um, Part of this is we have to just basically build our own manufacturing line, and, and I don't want to sit there and spend five minutes making every one of these onesies, and nobody else does. So we thought, let's just build a robot. Um, and so you know, the first thing that we do is we don't say, like, let's go see what's out there and, and spend $10,000 on a robot. Let's just build it ourselves. So we actually took the thingomatic. I have it on my desk because we're doing so much prototyping with it right now, but let's see if we can get this. Um, so this oh is actually <laughs> this is the old thingomatic. Um, and what's interesting about it is uh, this is now our glue machine. So it has these quick change um, slots for the syringes. Because what's also interesting is that the syringes, um, they come in, in very small quantities. They have to be frozen to negative 40 degrees. It's a very specialized glue. Um, and once we take it out of the freezer, we only have about 30 minutes to use it. So we have to be able to very quickly change out um, syringes of epoxy. Um, and then this has full XY axis control. And then it also extrudes down. Um, so this enables us to put down very controlled amounts of this glue in just the right location in multiple dots. Um, there's also a camera vision system in there too so that we can do quality control. We know that every single one that we send out is going to be perfect. Um, and what's interesting is that you know we built this with the intention of let's just try this out and once we have it up and running um, then we can kind of redesign the entire thing. You know, like we'll buy real motors or instead of using wood we'll use whatever metal. Um, and so actually most of these parts, like these feet, are MakerBotted. This is MakerBotted. The actual, we changed the XY um, thing. is That's, that's MakerBotted. The, the main glue controller, um, this is MakerBotted. And so we were going through a design review uh, two days ago, and we were like, okay, let's build the, the finalized version. And we're looking at this. What do we change? And 
other than the feet, we're not really changing anything because it works, um, and there's no reason to to fix something if it's if it's working. So we're really excited about that. Wow, I I think you've got an award for most creative use of a MakerBot in manufacturing <laughs> techniques ever. Awesome. <laughs> um, do you have any of your product around that people can that you can show up or anything that you can show people to kind of give them an idea of what a rest devices looks like? Yeah, definitely. Um, let me see if I can grab a onesie. Eduardo, do you have a onesie around there? Or Katie, do you have a onesie somewhere? So, um, so it's kind of made of a couple different components. The first one is the onesie, um, which is a normal, super awesome, soft organic onesie. Um, it For looks parents, people who aren't parents, a onesie is like something you. Garment your baby wears. Right, so it's it's basically like little little comfy pajamas, um, and so what's cool is these these stripes that go across it, uh, those are our sensors, um, and they're made out of normal t-shirt vinyl. So to a parent, and most importantly to a baby, um, it feels exactly like a normal onesie. There's really no difference. Um, and then we have a little turtle. We call it the turtle. Uh, this is the turtle, and this has a couple magnets on the bottom of it, and so it's it kind of clicks onto the onesie. And this collects respiration, skin temperature, body position, movement, um, everything. Sends it up to uh, the, what we call the base station. So it's a little lily pad. Um, they snap together. Um, and so this collects all the information, sends it to the cloud. We run all the information in the background. So if anything changes, we'll send an alert to your cell phone. So, so it's basically, as a parent, I would have used this to when my baby was born to basically, you know, do, instead of going in and checking every 10 minutes to see if she's still breathing, I could just yeah. check my phone, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and what's interesting is that we're, you know, right now we're very much a consumer product. We want to go back to the medical space. Um, and we've started to spend more time in the hospitals um, in kind of the NICUs and, um, and seeing how, how they operate. And it's interesting because there's alarms going off, you know, every 20 minutes. And normally it's something minor and totally fine. Um, like a sensor falls off, but you know, it's it's still it's terrible for the parents. So, um, you know, we're looking at kind of solving that process. We want to make sure that when there is an alert, it's because we want to notify the parent of something. And the vast majority of the time, we just want to tell them everything's okay. So, cool. Okay, um, I'm going to bring Kate in now, and I'm kind of curious, Kate, what kind of things do you see going on right now in Thingiverse? That what are the trend, What are the things that are hot right now in Thingiverse right now? Because you see everything on there. Right, I do. So um, I'm the community manager on Thingiverse. And uh, so one of the most exciting things that I think that I see coming in lately are all of the new digitizer scans. And we've seen people uh, start uploading what, um, what they've been scanning. And the most exciting part is really watching them learn how to use the technology because you can see someone might unbox it, they might try their first scan, and you they might share it to Thingiverse, not everyone does, you don't have to. Um, but uh, it might not be exactly what they were looking for, and I've seen this in Tom's uh, journey with his digitizer for sure. Um, and as, as he learned to optimize and to get the light right and to um, get the surfaces right, all of a sudden you see people having ideas and um, saying, oh, whoa, there's this whole other thing that I can scan that it hadn't occurred to them before. And you can watch that, um, that kind of thing take place as you look at what they're uploading on their profile um, day to day. There's this fabulous um, uh, lab out of Ohio or Iowa State University, Geofab Lab, and they've been uploading all of these sea creatures, all of these different um, really cool, um, you know, bi biology stuff, and and it's just been really cool to watch kind of the journey with this new technology and see see what people have. Um, have been doing with it because a lot of it is stuff that maybe we never thought of on our side and it's out in the community and it gets built upon, it gets iterated just like Tom talked about earlier, um, Zhang using his column to uh, add it into his um, game pieces. It's, it's just really fun to watch those stories develop. Cool. So uh, we've got a few minutes left. Is there anything that anybody wants to talk about, or any now that since we're all together, we've got a few minutes to kind of jab. Is is there anything on anybody's mind that you'd like to chat about? Well, I thought one of the things that sort of um, we sort of talked about 
of, in general is just this, the speed, the velocity. Um, we're all talking about stuff that we've made in the last month, the last week even. Um, you know, and so that's one of the real game changers to both the digitizer and the maker bot is that you know, we can think through making, right? I mean, this is what I tell my students, right? You don't know exactly how it's going to work until you've actually got two parts and you fit them together. And so it's so important to be able to do that, to be able to test it, to see how it looks. And then, like Thomas was saying, be able to take it to a trade show, take it to market. Uh, like Kari's saying, you know, take something, put it in the production line and test it, and then, and then get it out there. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm, as, you know, both as an educator and also as an artist, I'm finding fascinating about this community and about this industry is just the speed that everything is happening at. And it's, uh, it's really fascinating, the way that you can be so nimble that you can take feedback from, you know, a parent, as Thomas was saying, and then have a product, you know, a month later. I mean, that's amazing. What are you guys most excited about that's coming up personally and in the world? I'm going to start with you, Corey. What's, what's coming? I mean, you've got your, your factory about to roll out tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've got, so we have a couple new products coming out that we're really excited to get out there, and, but the, uh, the factory is probably the thing that we're really talking about a lot right now because we want to, you know, being able to get in front of so many people, so many, you know, so many other places, and like, like we were talking before, like once we drop one in front of your house, Bray, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be neat. We want to, you know, we want to really see what people are going to do with it and, and get, you know, get people excited. Everybody that comes through the factory here just goes crazy. I mean, it's really, I, I'd love to be able to show you around. It's kind of noisy that we're really getting ready for that show, so it's, there's a lot going on. But everyone that comes through here is just so excited and on fire, and they, they really want to jump in and start doing something. And, um, you know, but not everybody can make it out to Arizona. So we're really excited about putting this in front of people, you know, where, where they are now and, and seeing what comes of it. Will, will it be? Go ahead and tell people, if somebody sees that picture behind you and needs to go to your factory and make one, how, where do they go to learn more? Uh, to learn more about, about the about everything thing? Everything Local Motors is doing. Uh, so, a chance to call it your website. Yep, so um, go to localmotors.com. And uh, if you want to buy a rally fighter, there's a, a product button, and you can see the rally fighter. You can see the uh, we make a motorcycle uh, that's called oh, yeah. the race. We're making uh, these new powered bicycles that's called the cruiser. Uh, we're working on a drift trike, which is really neat. That's one of the things that everybody's racing around the parking lot right now. That's kind of uh, that's really really fun. Um, and then we also have there's a um, there's a forum on there. Uh, it's called Forge, and that's where people go to actually design things, and they they can work on projects that have started here, like, uh, you know, the cars and some of the larger vehicles, and then people can actually work on their own ideas. You know, they have, somebody has an idea for anything, anything vehicle-related, um, put it up there. You can get um, the real engineers here actually giving you a hand with it, um, people in the community. It's, re it's really neat. You can watch um, how products develop. And actually, that's how the Rally Fighter uh, started. That was actually uh, Sun Ho Kim, you know, came up with this design, put it up there, and it built so much interest. Um, that we actually decided, hey, that's a vehicle we should build. Um, but that didn't start as a top-down. That started as a, as a bottom-up. Somebody had an idea for something cool, and it generated enough interest that we decided to build them. So, yeah, there's a lot of neat things going on on the Forge. Cool. I, it's, I highly recommend going to both check out the website and the Forge because it's just an amazing community. And then Thomas, okay. I'm back. What do you, where, where do people go to learn more about Rust Devices, and what do you have coming up that we should all know? Um, so if you want to learn more about, about the products you're making, go to mimobaby.com. That's M-I-M-O baby.com. Um, and so there you can see pretty much everything about the about the onesie and the, and the monitor. Um, but we have a lot of really cool stuff coming up. So um, we like this whole baby space a lot, so we're trying to develop at least one product every nine months, kind of like every time there's a new baby coming out, we want to be there with it. <laughs> um, so we're, we're trying to grow as, as, the, as the kids grow. So, you know, the first product, Mimo Monitor, we have the bottle warmer and um, a crib mobile, a really awesome, intelligent crib mobile coming out um, that learns what your baby likes to, to go to sleep with. And then uh, the next challenge we're hoping to solve in the next year or so is uh, potty training. So hopefully this time next year we'll have solved potty training. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. huge. So, yep. yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun testing and building in the spring. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> if you could speed that one up, I've got an 18-month-old at home. Oh, yeah? Well, you can be our first tester. We're testing <laughs> in the spring, so I'll, I'll let you know. 
Perfect. Cool. Hey, and Tom, where do people go to see your work? Uh, my website, uh, TomBurtonWood.com. So that's T O M B U R T O N W O O D dot com. I've also just started a new website called uh, Learn 3D Printing dot co, not dot com. Some other guys got that. And um, so that I'm using just as a as a place for uh, to locating all my workshops and tutorials for my students because I teach all over the place. And then the big news I've got, I don't know when this is going to run, but um, I'm going to be doing a residency at a big museum here in Chicago, so I'm going to be 3D scanning their collection and 3D printing and making really cool and interesting uh, mashups of their, their stuff. So that's, that's set to go live soon. Then for Kate, you've got your Thingiverse, and I think one of the things we'll do here at the end is, is we'll get you a chance to get the usernames of all these folks so that we can, they can, everybody can go see their work on Thingiverse. And, and follow them and see what it is they're going to do. Is there anything else you want to wrap up with? Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. And as far as um, my job goes as community manager of Thingiverse, I just want everyone to know that there are a bunch of challenges coming up that I am very excited about. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And, uh, yeah, thanks to all of our panelists. Um, and thanks to everyone watching this now. Awesome. So this is um, this has been the first time we've done this. So if you have some feedback for us, feel free to drop it drop it in the comments, and we'll we'll put the uh, we'll put the information on how to you know and all the links associated with this connected to this with it as well, so we can point everybody to your your work and your projects. I have to say, like I feel very honored to be in this you know, to be able to talk to each of you. You're each of you are superstars that are. Truly blazing a trail into the future, doing amazingly cool stuff. So, uh, thank you for joining us today. And we're gonna have to do more of these. So, yeah. cool. cool. Thanks for thanks we're for on. setting the bar so high. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Right, thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye bye. Yes. Bye bye. Ciao.